Salam. All right. So as always, we'll start off with um, any aha moments, light bulb moments from last class. Last class was a lot of discussion. I think a lot, of, probably the most discussion we've had. So um, any discussions, any points that came out of our discussion from last week that was, you know, engaged and relevant, something that really caught your eye, or any questions, comments, things that we needed to clarify from last week. We shall start now. I'll start from this side. Amy, you're the man. Go for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there was one very interesting and kind of scary point that you mentioned that um, when oh man, I said um, did I? <laughs> when someone is trying not to do something out of the fear of Riyadh and in reality is actually doing Riyadh by doing so. By stopping. So out of the fear of Riyadh, you're doing Riyadh. So that, that is why I remember from last week it is stuck in my head, so it's kind of scary. What's a practical example of that? Uh, I'm, I don't want to be the imam, even though I know that I can read well, try to read wise and everything, because I fear that I might be showing off my skills. Whereas you know that if you were the imam, you could read well, and you could affect people with your recitation. So that could be an example. Is that acceptable? You stopping yourself out of the fear of, yeah, it could be, yeah. yeah. Can we go over that again? Because I forget why. Um, I remember we were also saying that if you stop yourself because you think, oh, I'm really good and, you know, I don't want people to, like, you know, um, kind of, like, tell yes. me that I'm or not, not tell me that I'm good, but, like, you know, what's the word? Yes. Praise? Yeah, Does anyone praise remember the quote? Yeah. Do not start something because of people, do, because you might be doing shirk. Do not stop something because of the people, because you might be doing sh yeah. Oh, that's the other around. Yeah. General. Okay. So that you you've got the gist of it, definitely, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was it. So, Fudayl ibn Iyad rahimahullah, he stated that um, whosoever stops a deed for the sake of the people he has committed riya, but whosoever who has started a deed for the sake of the people he has committed shirk. Right. And then we had the whole discussion around that at the end of the class about that. And I guess the point you're bringing up is when you stop a deed. So we gave the example, I think, last time of, um, I forget actually what example we gave. But for instance, it's like you have a consistent habit for, of, of praying your sunnah prayers. I think that's the example we gave last time. We said we have a consistent habit of yes, praying your yes. sunnah prayers. Yes. And then we said, uh, you know, pretend you're at school and out of righteousness, you're like, I don't want people to think that I'm righteous, so I'm not going to perform my sunnah prayers. So you stopped a deed for the people. That's why you stopped it. And that is Riyya. That is Riyya. That is showing that, that fear. So you fear Riyya. And because out of your fear of Riyya, you actually committed Riyya. So that's what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And the opposite of it is when you actually start the deed for the people, which is obviously doing something for other than Allah, which is shirk. Excellent. Good. Maybe one thing <coughs> from our discussion, uh, something I think pointed out was about when you're after Salah, everyone gets up to pray sunnahs. And then you say, oh, they're praying, I guess I should do my sunnahs too. Mm -hmm. So then at that point, you need to check and say, am I doing it for Allah or am I doing it just because I'm going to fit in? Because it's, like, it, it's one thing that people remind you to pray, but it's a completely other thing when you want to pray just so you don't look like the unpious one in the crowd. Yeah. The odd one out. The odd one out. And how did we say we could handle that? Does anyone remember? That's a real daily thing. Yeah. It's just when you're here. Like renewing our intention before we start it, just being like, I'm not doing this for the people, I'm doing this for well. Yeah, that's that's generally right, because the whole the riya thing is that it's always going to creep us creep up on us regardless. It's always going to be a battle that we're going to be fighting with until we die, right? Until we hit our graves, that's going to be a battle that we're going to deal with. So uh, the issue isn't whether or not we're facing that battle, because that us having that battle is a good sign. Us knowing that we're having that battle is actually a good thing because that shows that we're actually struggling with something. We're, we're fighting to at least become sincere with Allah. Um, but when we don't even recognize that that's an issue, that, then that is an issue itself. Right? So, uh, point being, what was I saying? Wow, I completely forgot. To fix your intention at the beginning? Yeah, fix your intention. That's it. Um, that it can creep in, but the point is to not let it overtake you. To not let the Riyah overtake the whole reason you started that act of worship. Perfect. Uh, I think you were the last person here. 
anything from last week that kind of stuck out? Um, I remember comment? when you were saying the, um, I don't think it was a hadith, I think it was just the same by early scholars, that we should check our intention before the act, in the middle of the act, and after the act. Um, it's just, I think it's important because we might, you know, start it off with the right intentions, but we might kind of like get sidetracked in the middle, and it's always good to just, you know, keep checking. Excellent. Yeah, that's definitely. And that's like a practical way to kind of work with our intention and kind of re-examine uh, or re-kind of check ourselves every act of worship, and especially, you know, IW, perfect example, right? Like every, um, for anyone who's there from morning to pretty much at night, you know, who's really setting up, who's involved in the dialogues with the people, who's, um, you know, who's there throughout the whole day, you know, this is, uh, it's even more of a reason to just constantly take a, a second out and just re-examine why we're doing it. Why, why is it that I'm here at this position right now talking to this person? Is it because I just want to be seen by the people as someone who knows Islam? Or is it because I want sincerely what's good for them, right? Is, is that the reason? Is it because I want them, for the sake of Allah, obviously, to be true worships of them? I want them to understand what Islam really is, the beauty of Islam, and what Allah has given for all of mankind, right? So it, it's definitely something very, very important for all of us to constantly work with our intentions and constantly renew them every chance we get. Um, perfect. Um, in terms of last week, anyone want to give a quick review? What did we talk about? We talked about four specific cases last week. Anyone remember the example that I gave? Last week was about Riyadh. Yeah. The introduction of it and four specific cases of Riyadh. Yes. You know, four cases where. Four types of Riyadh. It could be Riyadh or it could not be Riyadh. Anyone remember those four? Some of them was cheating. Okay. You remember what that example was? Oh, exam. Exam. So an exam, so someone had to go into the exam and it's either they prepared for the exam or they uh, brought in like a cheat sheet. Okay, so there's one person we said. Pretend you're going into the, so just for everyone else who wasn't here last week. So we said last week, when we're talking about the cases of Riyadh, or the categories of Riyadh, or I guess you could say the types of Riyadh, let's just say that. That um, we said, imagine that you're going and you're studying for an exam. So you're studying for an exam, and you walk in to that exam. So you have many different actions that you can take throughout the course of that exam. One thing is you say, you know what, I'm going to write this exam on my own efforts. I'm going to do this exam, I know my stuff, if I fail, if I do whatever, I'm going to do it on my own efforts, and that's what you're going to do. That was case one. That's the one who, who's going to say, you know what, I'm doing everything for Allah, I don't need anything else, you know, to, to, to assist me, or to, to be a, I guess, a, 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 well, yeah, okay, so let me just go through the case, if it makes more sense that way. So first person is someone who, who, who does it on his own. The second person is he, someone who says, you know what, um, I don't intend on really studying for this exam. I intend on cheating full 100%. So I'm taking in a cheat sheet with me, and that's his intention from the get-go, that he's going to pull this out and he's going to cheat during the exam. The third person, or the third category, we said was someone who, who he, starts, he starts writing the test, and he's like, no, I'm going to do it all by myself. There's no problem. I'm going to do it all. But his friend, he's the one who says, you know what, here's, here's the answers to certain questions. So he takes it, he starts writing it down, but then he starts struggling with that you know, that friend, does he want the cheat sheet? Does he want the notes? Does he not want the notes? Um, and that was the third case. What was the fourth case? That someone gives it to him, the cheat sheet, but then he struggles and says, no, I'm, he, he yeah. had to. I know there were three cases. Isn't that one he, he's prepared, but he also brings a cheat sheet just in case? There we go. That was the 50 50 case. Yes, exactly. So, so the fourth case, one of the fourth cases was that, so he goes in and he says, yes, I've studied for the exam, but I'm also going to bring in a cheat sheet. Just in case, you know, like if, if I don't know an answer to one of the questions, I'll have my cheat sheet there to help me out. So we said the person, the first person who says he's going to do it all on his own, he's the person who? Ikhlas. Ikhlas, 100%. He has no worries there, right? He's, he's doing everything for the sake of Allah. Then we said the person who goes in with the intention of 100% cheating. His example is like that person who? 100% Riyah. 100% Riyah. He's doing it for other than Allah. He doesn't care. He's doing it sincerely for something else for another purpose, using something else as the goal or as the object of, uh, of, of, of pleasure, I guess you could say, or the thing that he's seeking his reward from. Third thing, we said 50-50 case. That's the example of, you remember? The 50-50 case. When someone brings in the cheat sheet and the... Aspect? Yeah. Remember we had the whole discussion around... Teaching and one, one salary? That was one, that was a subset. 
And we said, remember, we had a whole case of, we had the whole discussion around, um, you know, can we do an act of worship for people and Allah? Right? And then we had the whole discussion about parents. Like, what if our parents, we're doing it for our parents, but we're also doing it to please Allah? Does that fall into it? So, is it, is it, is it permissible? Is it allowed for us to, let's say, pray for the pleasure of people, but also to seek the reward from Allah? Is that allowed? No, right? That's a 50-50 case. And why did we say that wasn't allowed? Does anyone remember? Wasn't there a hadith or something or an ayah that says, um, on the Day of Judgment, when God brings everyone and He calls out whoever did something for someone other than me, go find the reward from them? Exactly. Exactly. And Allah will call out on the day, or a crier, someone will call out on the Day of Judgment, and He will say to everyone, all of mankind will be standing there, from the time of Adam to now, or to the Day of Judgment, that Allah will, or a caller will cry out and say that, if whosoever, you know, sought pleasure or sought reward in anyone else other than Allah, or anyone who ascribed a partner in reward with Allah, so he sought reward from Allah and something else, then let them go seek the reward from that other object, from that other person. Because Allah is the least, yeah? But what if we like to make our parents to seek their freedom? Okay, yeah. What does that mean? That means we from Yeah, so that was one of the cases we talked about last week. And we said that because parents is kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's an odd, not an odd, but it's, a, it's an exception. Because in the Quran, Allah is, you know, we, we have strict orders of obeying our parents. It's a strict order, right? It's not like we have a, but the point being is that when we go to do that act of worship, though, that act of worship still should still needs to be with our hearts for the sake of Allah. And uh, the last case was salary case teaching. Well. Oh yeah, that was another one, right? The fourth, the uh, where we were talking about the uh, the when you're doing it not for other people, but you're doing it for an other purpose. So if you're teaching, but you're also seeking an income out of that, so you have a dual purpose behind it. So it's not for the pleasure of people, but it's for the pleasure of not the pleasure, but you're seeking it to please Allah, yes, but you're also doing it to get some financial income or some worldly benefit. Right? And we said, what was the case with that one? Anyone remember? You said that it's okay because you're not asking for the, you're not seeking the praise from the people, you just want the money to feed the life of the it, It's a duty, right? And, and, uh, and the point being here, we said that, but some of the scholars said that um, if you do do it, like pretend you do do it for a dual income, basically your reward will just be decreased by the amount of that intention. So if your intention was like, okay, 90% I'm doing it for the income, 10% for Allah, like in terms of that, then you're only going to get 10% of the reward, really. But if your intention was, no, I'm doing it really only for Allah and the money is just a side set, something that's going to come in, then inshallah you'll get the full reward that way as well. Um, but then we said in, 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 uh, in, in the discussions of usul or in fiqh, that when there's something that's needed or when there's something that's an obligation upon a community, so we set the example of like praying in congregation, right? So because praying in congregation is an act of worship, to support that, we need to build masjids to allow that act of worship to take place. So in the same way, we talked about how, for instance, teaching, and specifically that example of teaching and getting money for that, is that Teaching is necessary in this part of the world for sure. We're limited in teachers, we're limited in terms of people who can teach the deen, especially for the next generation of people who are coming. So we need to have people qualified to teach the deen. But if we want people to continue to teach the deen, we need to pay them so they're not worried about their dueling, they're not worried about having to work somewhere else, so at least they're being fully funded so they can take care of their families and continue doing the job for the sake of Allah. So when that's the point, when it comes to that point, then it becomes necessary to fund that person to be able to continue the act of worship so he can continue in spreading the khair. And then we said it just gets removed from this whole conversation, priya or not. Because at that point, then it's something necessary for the deen to continue in terms of establish the deen upon in this, in this community. Okay, those are the different cases. Definitely confused, I think I've confused like a random amount of people who are here new today. So I apologize for that. But inshallah we will begin today's class. And today's class is basically focused around the dangers of Riyah. So we're talking about this whole discussion of Riyah. What is Riyah? Why is it, you know, why is it so important to our Sinadeen? But now, what is the real danger of Riyah? 
Does anyone know any, just off the top of their head, why we are showing off would be uh, a legitimate concern for any one of us in our team? Well, <clears throat> Riyaz is from Nepal. Okay, in what sense? Explain. Well, because at the, because your intention isn't fully for Allah, at that okay. point you're kind of mixing your intentions for people as well. So it might not be accepted. Okay, so the deed might not be accepted. The deed might not be accepted okay. since the intention is a fundamental part of any deed that is done for Allah. It's kind of like foundation. You have to start off with proper intention. Yeah. It's kind of necessary that your intentions are pure. So that's definitely one danger, for sure, that the deed itself will be rejected. So imagine someone, and I'm going to pick on IEW just because I think it's relevant right now with everyone who's here, is that imagine, and this is, it should allow us to rethink and really examine ourselves, is imagine we're spending all the hours, all the nights, all the you know, early mornings, setting up, doing everything that we've been doing, that you guys have been doing for IEW. And imagine that it wasn't sincere. Imagine that it wasn't for Allah. Imagine that it was... You know, maybe you were doing it because you didn't want to be the odd one out. Maybe it was because you wanted the people in the MSA to know that you were someone skilled in a certain way or a certain, you know, area of expertise. Maybe it was, you know, just so you could, you know, sometimes it's uh, people have a need themselves to feel wanted. And, you know, so you wanted to get that across. You wanted to feel more um, wanted, I guess, from the people. So because of that, you did it. So there was a mixed intention. Now, you're hoping for the reward. But in reality, do you think you would deserve that reward on the Day of Judgment? Out of all the effort that was put in, if someone didn't do it for Allah, then that reward is gone. So just imagine the amount of hours, the amount of work, the amount of effort, the amount of time, the amount of money even, the amount of struggle, the amount of sleepless nights that we might have put in. And if just one thing, our intention, wasn't solid for Allah, the deed is done. The deed is gone. Right? So that's one specific danger that we can definitely address. So dangers, I'm just going to start writing them here. Any other dangers that come to mind? Anything else? It makes a person arrogant and that is highly displeasing as well as. Arrogant. How, how can you explain? So one of the dangers of performing a deed for other than Allah would be arrogance. Right? Okay. Anything else? the ability to do that deed is only a blessing from Allah. Right? So uh, I think we started off the class by saying that one of the blessings that Allah puts upon you know, people is that whosoever Allah wishes well for, He gives them understanding of the deed. Right? He gives them understanding of the deed. So if Allah has given you the ability to take, like, come to a lecture or come to a class or to learn something about His deed, it's because Allah has intended well for you. It's not because you thought I would just come and attend this class and I would benefit myself. No, it wasn't that you had anything to do with that. It was because Allah chose you to be of those who would be able to benefit from that deed. So for you to be at that point, then say, you know what, it's because of me, and describe that to yourself, that, yeah, that's definitely a deluded state. Definitely. Anything else? Cool. Okay. No worries. So, one of the things that is so... I guess dangerous about Riyadh, aside from all these other things, is that it is almost sometimes impossible to recognize whether or not we actually are suffering through Riyadh. 
And that is obviously very, very critical because if we're not able to recognize that we're suffering through Riyadh or that we have a problem with showing off or that we aren't purely doing our deeds for Allah, then how can we how can we be so certain that Allah will, you know, have mercy upon us on the day of judgment? How are we so certain that we won't be amongst that category that Allah says, you know what? For all those people who did those deeds for other than Allah, then go seek it from that person who you did it for. How do we know that Allah doesn't you know, shun us away on that day that we need Him the most because we weren't sincere to Him in the dunya when we were doing our acts of worship. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, right, that riya or showing off in your acts of worship, it's more hidden than a ant, a black ant, on a black rock on a moonless night. So it, meaning it, it's very, 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 very difficult to really detect whether or not where, where we have this disease within our hearts. And so inshallah what we're going to try to go through today is the dangers and then some of the warning signs. What are a few of the warning signs that we can at least look out for within our own daily life to say, okay, maybe we are suffering through it. Maybe these are signs that show us that we might be suffering through Ria. Okay, so one of the other dangers is that it definitely weakens one's iman. Does anyone understand why that would be? Why would showing off or doing deeds other than for the sake of Allah weaken your faith in Allah or weaken your faith in Islam altogether? Any ideas? Discussion? It's okay. Because when you're committing Riyya, you are, whether you're conscious or not, relying upon the, your source of pleasure, I mean, you're, you're seeking pleasure actually, from the people. So you're somehow re, uh, decreasing your reliance upon Allah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Anything else? I think someone had their hand up here. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, one of the things, yeah, I, yeah, because one of the things about Iman is what? It's reliance, right? Oh. Like you said, it's reliance upon Allah, upon all things. That's one of the things of faith, that because we know of the Day of Judgment, because we know who Allah is, because we know of the angels, we know of everything, it causes us to rely upon Him and Him alone. It, it, it gives us that certainty that we can rely upon Allah. But when we choose to say that, you know what, we're going to rely upon the people instead, obviously we're just then putting that, we in our hearts then don't feel like we can rely upon Allah. We ourselves are saying that, you know, we're, it's as if we're saying that, you know what, the people are more worthy of our reliance than Allah is. Or that are seeking our, our pleasure than Allah is, yeah? Just to add upon that, you are relying on something or someone who is weak. You're not relying on someone who is, you know, because you're relying on people. What, yeah. what, are, what are people going to do? Right? So if you're relying on Allah, you're not gonna, He's not going to let you down. Yeah. And you know, that's one of the things, and it's just a side note, right? When we think about, you know, we always say, think good of Allah. Or we always say, think good of Allah, right? Or, or think the best of Allah. And we said that in previous classes, that whenever you come into a difficulty or a problem, it's very important for the believer to always think the best of Allah and to know who Allah is. And especially in times of distress, especially when someone is going through affliction and going through problems, you know, we always say, think best of Allah, think the best of Allah, and that He will be there. But a part of that also means to know that Allah is able to do everything and all things. So a part of thinking good of Allah is to know that He's able to truly take care and change your situation for you. Because one thing is that we might think that Allah, you know, in that case that, okay, we're going through a problem, we're going through a difficulty, we want to think good of Allah, and our thinking good of Allah is that Allah is going to put mercy upon me. He's going to help me in this situation, or He's going to be merciful to me in this case. That's one point. Yeah, someone might be like a normal person. I might have compassion towards your problem, but does that mean I can do anything towards you? I might not be able to help you though. Right? So you might be poor, you might be going through a lot of difficulties. I might walk by and feel compassion in my heart for you, yes. But that doesn't mean I'll be able to change your situation and help you out of that difficulty. That doesn't mean that. But Allah is able to change the situation of that person. And He's the most merciful. 
So it's not just thinking that Allah is going to be merciful to that person. It's also thinking that Allah is able to do all things. And because he's able to do all things, he can help me in my situation. Side tangent. Sorry. So, weakens iman because what's the purpose of life? What's the purpose that Allah created us? To worship him, right? This is the sole purpose of our creation. That we have been created to worship Allah. And that was the main, the only purpose for our creation. Was to worship Allah. Now, if this is the purpose that Allah created the heavens and the earth. This is the reason that Allah created human beings. This is the reason that Allah gave life to us. And now we're born. And what are we doing? We're Worshipping other. We're seeking pleasure from Allah. I mean, we're seeking pleasure from the people. We're, 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 we're corrupting that very purpose for which we've been created. Right? So when we're corrupting that very purpose for which we've been created, obviously it's going to weaken our mind. It's going to weaken our faith. It's going to weaken our, our certainty and everything that comes along with it. So that's one thing. We talked about loss of deed. But one of the other discussions, and this is actually the scarier part, is that Allah says in the Quran in Surah Zumar, Yes, in Surah Zumar. He says that, and indeed it has been revealed to you and to those before you that if you practice shirk, so if you practice associating partners with Allah, surely all your deeds will be in vain. All your deeds will be in vain. Interestingly enough, there's a difference of opinion upon what this means. Some scholars actually state that this could be referring to minor shirk as well, meaning riya. Meaning riya. Meaning that it's very possible. Allah knows that the majority say no, this is referring to major shirk. But the point being, we talked about last week, is for us, it's important to always take what? The safest route. And the safest route here is to, okay, if it could mean minor shirk, if it could mean riya, can you imagine all your deeds gone? Because we chose to seek pleasure in an act of worship for other than Allah. Just that chance. Can we imagine that? Can we imagine the impact of that? That on the day of judgment, we walk to Allah, we walk barefooted, uncircumcised, naked, we stand in front of Allah, and Allah shows us our records, Allah shows us our scales. And on that day, we're happy, we're excited, because we think we've done so much good, we think we've done so much khayr for Allah. But then on that day we see that everything is gone. It doesn't exist. Because why? Because we chose to seek pleasure in that act other than for Allah. We did it for the people. Scary thing. Obviously, Allah, well, if, it's, if it's exactly what, you know, but the point being, it could be true. Point being is we're not 100% sure. And so for us, it's, 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 it's very, very important to always just keep that in the back of our heads that, okay, loss of one deed is one thing, but what if, what if it meant loss of all of our deeds? What if it meant, just Im imagine the deeds that we did just today. What if every single deed today was gone and it wasn't accounted for on the Day of Judgment because we did it for someone else? Right? Uh, and that's why... It's, it's so critical for us to beg Allah, really beg Allah, to keep us and our hearts firm and sincere to Him at all times. Because this, 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 this disease can creep, us, creep up on us anytime. It can creep up on us anytime. We don't know when we do something and some of the surroundings and shaitan whispers to us and we give in to that. We give in to that deception. We give in to that, 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 uh, that desire of seeking the pleasure from people. We never know. And the only one who can assist us is Allah. The only one who can help us is Allah in that day. So that's where who should we seek our help from? Allah. We should beg Allah and plead to Allah to keep us sincere in all our acts of worship. Whatever it is. The smallest prayer, the smallest you know, charity we give, whatever it is. But we ask Allah to make us sincere. And inshallah, by the end of it, we'll figure out why that's really important. Another um,
danger of Riyadh is humiliation. And not, maybe not humiliation in this life. Maybe not humiliation in this life. But definitely, definitely humiliation in the hereafter. And humiliation not just on a small scale, because here, if we, if we get exposed in front of the people, who are we really getting exposed in front of a small community? A small amount of people? Maybe 100, 200, maybe 300, 400, maybe 1,000, maybe? On the Day of Judgment, if we get humiliated, we'll be exposed in front of all of mankind. From the time of Adam Islam to the time of the Day of Judgment. That's all of mankind. And we're not just talking about a thousand people now, we're talking about billions of people that we would be exposed in front of. Abdullah ibn Umar, Umar he narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said that whosoever boasts of his deeds to others, whosoever boasts of his, basically he, he does, he boasts of his deeds to others, seeking the pleasure of other people in that deed, Allah will humiliate him in front of his creation and dishonor and defame him on that day. A very, very strong hadith for us, again, to ponder upon. That this is the Prophet ﷺ, meaning, you know, sometimes we get that desire, to, even in the passing, you know, sometimes, and wallahim, wallahim, but you know, sometimes, even in the passing in conversations, we might be talking to our friends, we might be talking to our brothers, sisters, we might be talking to our sisters. And just in the passing, you know, you might be like, oh yeah, I'm a part of the IEW team, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And Allah Adam, right? It was sometimes, who knows what that real reason for that was. You know, and it happens. Sometimes, you know, brother, oh, so what are you up to these? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm studying or I'm teaching, you know, this and that. Or And you know there comes a point where you, there's a point where you, enough, there's enough, there's a limit to where he asks you and you give him just enough information that he knows what you're doing and it's not showing up, but then you go above and beyond. Oh yeah, but I'm also teaching in this class, there was a hundred people there, I did this, I did that. We've just crossed that line, right? We just crossed that line and we're now seeking that pleasure because we want people to think good of us. And this hadith should be a reason for us to say, you know what, next time it should just make us more conscious, more aware of that maybe we shouldn't, you know, talk about our deeds that openly in front of people. Maybe we should keep them more secret and sincere and, and, and private with Allah. Because that's all that matters, really. People don't need to know of my deeds. People don't need to know about anything I do for the sake of Allah. The only one that I care about that knows is Allah. And if Allah knows, that's all that matters. And the famous hadith. The famous reason, another reason, is because one of the first people who will enter into Jahannam are scholars, the one who uh, go to jihad and die a martyr, yep. the one who if charity, yep. what yeah. three people, charity, eh? yeah, yeah. So it was the the one who fought. The one who was wealthy and he gave in the cause of Allah, and the one who uh, taught or he was. Just, yeah. Yeah. So the Prophet, in a, and this is a famous hadith, we all know this hadith, that on the day of judgment, the first three people to enter into the hellfire will be the scholar or the person who learned the deen and he taught others. And it will be brought forth in front of Allah on the day of judgment. And Allah will ask him, You know, I gave you this blessing. I gave you this knowledge, what did you do with it? And he will say, oh Allah, I, I, I called the people to your worship. I, I taught people your deen. And then Allah, a caller will say that you have lied. That the only reason you really taught people was so people could think that you're righteous. So people could think that you're knowledgeable. And so at that point, he will be taken and dragged to the hellfire. And the same thing will happen with the person who was wealthy. He gave, in this dunya, he gave for the sake of Allah. He did, or he gave for the sake of Allah. But then on the Day of Judgment, Allah, the one who knows the inner, Allah who's the only one who's really aware of what is taking place in the heart of the man or the woman. Only Allah is aware. And on that day, Allah will expose him. And he will say, 
You know, I gave you this wealth. What did you do with it? He will say, oh Allah, I gave in charity for your sake. I, I helped this organization. I helped this cause. And Allah will say, no. You did it so people could think that you're wealthy and that you're someone righteous and that you're someone who gave in charity and that you're a, a good person. Because of that, he will be dragged into the hellfire. And then the last person, the person who, uh, who fought for the sake of Allah, same thing. He will say, why, you know, I gave you this ability. What did you do with it? He said, I fought for your sake, O oh Allah. I fought for your sake. He will say, no, you didn't fight for my sake. You fought so people could think that you were a warrior, that you were strong, you were courageous. Point being, we do not want to be in this category. We don't want to be in any of these categories, actually. Forget about this category. We don't want to be in any of these categories. And we ask Allah sincerely with the bottom of our heart that He doesn't make us amongst any of these people. That He makes us amongst those who are truly sincere for Him in every act of worship that we do to Him. And we ask Allah to truly make our hearts you know, sincere and, 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 and pure for His sake and His sake alone in anything that we do, and that we reach Him with a pure heart that was sincere to Him, inshallah. I mean. So, now, these were some of the dangers. These were just some of the dangers, and there's many more. There's many, many, many more dangers that we can talk about. Now, what I wanted to discuss before we, before we actually finish off for uh, today's class is, what are the warning signs? How can me and you know if we're suffering through this problem of Riyadh. How is it that we can examine or start looking into our own actions and our own life and say, okay, maybe we are suffering through this issue. Maybe we are suffering through this problem. So, Allah says in the Quran, and this is one reason, and there, the scholars have talked about several, I'm only going to talk about two here today right now. Two warning signs that we can look at ourselves and see whether or not we might have this problem. Start examining ourselves. So Allah says in the Quran, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاؤُونَ so, so woe to those who pray. Woe to those who pray. Those who are heedless of their prayer. Meaning they're not taking care of their prayers. They're shifting around. They're not really praying it on time as they should be. They're heedless of their prayers. Those who make basically, who show their deeds to the people. They pray or they, they, they do their deeds so that people can see of them, of what they're doing. Now, it's interesting here because what does Allah link with showing off? Prayer. What does Allah link with it? What about prayer? Heedlessness. Heedlessness in prayer. That is maybe probably the number one sign of whether or not we are truly suffering from this problem of Riyah or not. Is because when we're amongst the Muslims, when we're amongst the community, we're going to pray. Time for Aisha comes, people are praying, you're going to pray. Right? The time for Mother comes, you're going to pray. It's a part of the community. But the real test is when you're at home and the Maghrib Adhan goes off or you know it's Maghrib time, are you praying your prayer as you would if you were in the community? Are you praying your prayer with the same enthusiasm, with the same devotion, with the same, uh, you know, uh, with the same importance at home as you are in the community? Or are you, or are we one of those, you know, maybe we're, we delay our prayers. Like, okay, no, we'll get around to it. There's no rush. There's no, you know, there's no people watching. Or, you know, there's not enough people here, so maybe I can, I, I can finish doing what I'm doing and then I'll pray. So that's one sign. And this doesn't mean we have it, but this is one very critical sign to say or to show us, ourselves, whether or not we might be suffering through this problem. Whether or not we might be suffering through this problem of, of Riyadh. Because the whole point is, if we're going to be praying on time in front of people, and we're not praying on time, or we're not giving it the right haq when we're alone, there's a problem. There's a problem. So that was the first thing. Second thing is, basically when we're lazy, and it's the same concept, is when we're being lazy in our acts of worship. When we're being lazy, when we're... We're not basically showing enthusiasm in our acts of, in our acts of worship. Uh, Allah says in Surah Nisa that, and He's talking about the hypocrites here. In this verse, Allah is talking about the hypocrites. And He says that the hypocrites, basically, they intend to deceive Allah. That's their goal. Their goal is that they think they can actually truly deceive Allah. But He is deceiving them. But Allah is truly deceiving them. 
And when they stand for prayer, they stand lazily, showing themselves to the people and not remembering Allah except a little bit. Not remembering Allah except a little. And so Allah links this conversation about the munafiqun, about the hypocrites. And He links it to the point that they're those, the characteristic of the hypocrite or the munafiqun is who prays lazily. He's not really giving his sujood its true right. He's not, you know, really concentrating in his prayer or trying to concentrate in his prayer. Rather, it's, you know, there's Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and then there's Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Right? He's not really praying. He's just praying to get it over with. There's a big difference. There's one category of believer who says, my goal in this prayer isn't to just get it over with, it's to achieve something through it. It's to raise my iman, it's to raise my connection with Allah, it's to raise my own uh, relationship with Allah, it's to get closer to Allah through this act of worship, or through any act of worship that I do. But then there's other categories of people who's like, they don't really care about that. Their goal is just to finish the act of worship. When do I get to the end? Right? And so Allah is warning us here, and, and, and it's, it's a sign for us, and it's something that we should ponder about is how are we truly treating our prayers, bottom line. Right, the first thing which Allah will hold to us account for on the Day of Judgment is our salah. Is our salah.